Hey everybody, today we'll be talking about how to build the ground state electron configurations for multi-electron atoms. That is, every element in the periodic table except for hydrogen. Now we're only going to be talking about ground state electron configurations in which the electrons reside in orbitals of lowest energy. So from here on out, every time I use the term electron configuration, I'm going to be referring to the ground state electron configuration for a given atom. To build these ground state electron configurations, we need to keep a couple of things in mind. For one, the Pauli exclusion principle, which states that no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. And that implies that each orbital can have only two electrons in it at the most, and that two electrons in the same orbital must have opposite spin orientations. One of them is spin up, the other one spin down. We also need to make sure that we understand the general energy ordering for orbitals in multi-electron atoms, which follows the diagonal rule according to the diagram shown here. If you'd like to know more about these topics, please check out my video entitled, Why Does the Periodic Table Have Such a Funky Shape? And that will go over these topics in great detail. In addition, we need to recognize that each sublevel can hold a certain amount of electrons due to the number of orbitals found in each sublevel. The S sublevel can hold 2, the P sublevel can hold 6, the D sublevel can hold 10, and the F sublevel can hold 14 electrons. The rule by which we build ground state electron configurations is called the Aufbau Principle. The word Aufbau means to build up, and the principle basically states that electrons will fill the orbitals in increasing energy order, which means that the lowest energy orbitals will fill up, and then when they're full, higher energy orbitals will start to fill up, and so on. The electron configurations of hydrogen and helium were discussed in my last video, and they're pretty straightforward since the only orbital with electrons in it is the 1s orbital. So the electron configurations of hydrogen and helium are 1s1 and 1s2, respectively. The orbital diagrams for these two elements are also shown. Once the 1s orbital is full, the lowest energy orbital available, and thus the next orbital to be filled, is the 2s orbital. Thus, the electron configurations of lithium and beryllium are 1s2, 2s1, and 1s2, 2s2, respectively. The next orbital in line, or rather, the next set of orbitals to be filled, are the 2p orbitals. Remember, the 2p orbitals are degenerate, which means they're energetically equivalent, so the electron doesn't have any particular preference on which 2p orbital gets filled up first. The electron configurations for boron and carbon are 1s2, 2s2, 2p1, and 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, respectively. Notice the orbital diagram for carbon. The two 2p electrons are in separate orbitals with the same spin orientation. This phenomenon is called Hund's rule, and it states that when electrons occupy energetically equivalent orbitals, they populate each orbital one at a time until all of the orbitals are half full. Then and only then will any additional electrons pair up with any existing electrons in those half full orbitals. It's kind of like a bunch of strangers getting on a bus. Unless these people are super friendly, each of them are going to take an empty seat until every seat has one passenger in it. And then, once that happens, every subsequent passenger has no choice but to pair up with an existing passenger. So now that we know the Pauli exclusion principle, the relative energy ordering for orbitals and multi-electron atoms, the number of electrons that each sublevel can hold, the Aufbau principle, and Hund's rule, we're in a pretty good position at this point to build the ground state electron configuration for just about every element in the periodic table. The electron configurations of nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon are shown here, along with their corresponding orbital diagrams. Notice that, in the case of nitrogen and oxygen, Hund's rule is used to correctly portray the number of paired and unpaired electrons in each of the 2p orbitals. Now I'm sure you can imagine how long-winded some of these electron configurations can get, especially for an element like uranium, which has 92 electrons. Lucky for us, however, chemists have come up with a way to abbreviate an element's electron configuration by representing the inner electron configuration, which is the electron configuration of the previous noble gas in the periodic table, by using the chemical symbol of that noble gas in brackets. For instance, the electron configuration of sodium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. The inner electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, which is that of neon, the previous noble gas. Thus, the abbreviated electron configuration of sodium is Ne in brackets, followed by 3s1. The 3s1 portion is called the outer electron configuration. Let's look at a mini periodic table of the first 18 elements, from hydrogen to argon. Along with the chemical symbols and atomic numbers, the electron configurations for the electrons in the outermost principal level are also shown. Notice any patterns? 
Take a look at the similarities between the elements that belong to the same vertical column. With the exception of helium, elements belonging to the same group have pretty much the same electron configuration for their outermost principal shell. The only difference, of course, being the value of the principal quantum number. The reason why elements in the same group have similar chemical properties is because they have the same number of outer shell electrons, also called valence electrons. The number of valence electrons that an element has is the primary factor that determines, among other things, whether that element will form an ionic bond, a covalent bond, or any chemical bond at all for that matter. And it's all because of the element's electron configuration, which fundamentally is the result of the electrons behaving as waves. We can better understand electron configurations by dividing the periodic table up into four sections called orbital blocks. The S block, P block, D block, and F block are shown here. These blocks are divided according to which type of orbitals hold the highest energy electrons for each element. So an element in the S block has its highest energy electrons in S orbitals. An element in the P block has its highest energy electrons in P orbitals, and so on. Let's take a look at each block individually, starting with the S block. These are the S block elements, which include the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals, and helium. The outer electron configurations of these elements are shown. In the case of alkali metals, the electron configuration of each element is simply the inner electron configuration plus ns1, where n is the period of the periodic table in which the element is found. For alkaline earth metals, it's the inner electron configuration plus ns2. Notice that for all of these elements, the highest energy electrons reside in s orbitals. Let's move on to the p block elements, which include the six groups that are found on the right hand side of the periodic table. In the case of the elements in the boron group, the electron configuration is the inner electron configuration plus ns2 and p1. For elements in the carbon group, it's the inner electron configuration plus ns2 and p2. For the nictogens, that's nitrogen, phosphorus, and so on, the electron configuration is the inner electron configuration plus ns2 and p3. For the calcogens, that's oxygen, sulfur, and so on, the electron configuration is the inner electron configuration plus ns2 and p4. For the halogens, that's fluorine, chlorine, and so on, the electron configuration is going to be the inner electron configuration plus ns2 and p5. And finally, the electron configuration of a noble gas in the p block is the inner electron configuration plus ns2 and p6. And remember, n is simply the period number of the periodic table. For p-block elements located in the fourth period and below, there's also going to be 10 d electrons in the n-1 principal energy level. Bromine's electron configuration, for instance, is going to be the inner electron configuration, which is that of argon, plus 4s2, 3d10, 4p5. Now let's move on to the d-block elements, which are the transition metals. This is where electron configurations start to become a little bit unpredictable. To understand these, let's take a look at the relative energy ordering of the orbitals. Since the 4s orbital is lower in energy than the 3d orbital, the 4s orbital generally fills up completely before the 3d orbitals start to fill. But these orbitals are so close in energy that in some cases an electron can minimize its energy by populating a 3d orbital before populating a 4s orbital. This results in electron configurations that deviate from what is expected. Take a look at scandium, titanium, and vanadium. These three electron configurations are to be expected. The 4s orbital fills up completely before the 3d orbitals start to fill. But look at chromium. The electron configuration of chromium is 4s1, 3d5, instead of the expected electron configuration of 4s2, 3d4. Chromium's electron configuration is somewhat of an anomaly. The reason why chromium has this anomalous electron configuration is because the electrons enjoy a special stability that is associated with the half-full d sublevel. This stability results in a lower energy electron configuration than if the 4s orbital were full and the 3d sublevel had 4 electrons. Because of the special stability associated with half-full or completely full d sublevels, there are other transition metals that also have anomalous electron configurations. These include copper, niobium, molybdenum, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, silver, platinum, and gold. Since these electron configurations are unexpected, they can only be confirmed experimentally through a technique called spectroscopy. In general, a d-block element's electron configuration will include its inner electron configuration, one or two electrons in the n-s orbital, and some electrons in the n-1 d orbitals. And finally, let's turn our attention to the f-block metals, which include the lanthanides and actinides, collectively known as the inner transition metals. 
For similar reasons that we previously discussed, some of these metals also have anomalies in their electron configurations. But in general, the electron configuration of an f-block metal will be the inner electron configuration, two electrons in the ns orbital, some electrons in the n-2f orbitals, and in some cases, some electrons in the n-1d orbitals. So when it comes to writing the ground state electron configuration of an element simply based on its position in the periodic table, I like to think of my periodic table as a game board. I start out at hydrogen and I move one element at a time until I get to my desired element, making sure that I take care of all of the electrons and give all of the electrons an address along the way. Let's write the ground state electron configuration of arsenic. Arsenic has 33 electrons. The first two of them will go in the 1s orbital, so we've got 1s2. The next two electrons will go in the 2s orbital, and the following six will go in the 2p orbitals, so we've got 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. The next two electrons will go in the 3s orbital, and the following six will go in the 3p orbitals, so we've got 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. The next two electrons will go in the 4s orbital, and the following 10 electrons will go in the 3d orbitals. So now we've got 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10. We've got three electrons left, so they'll go in the 4p orbitals. So our finished product is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p3. And of course, we can abbreviate this and write down the electron configuration as AR in brackets, 4s2, 3d10, 4p3. Obviously, the best way to approach these electron configurations is to practice, 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 practice. With enough practice, you'll start to become accustomed to the patterns and you'll kind of have a feel for them. And remember, the electron configurations of some of those d-block and f-block metals are simply impossible to determine based on their positions in the periodic table alone, and you can only really determine them experimentally through spectroscopy. So that is all. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and or found it helpful. And as always, have a good one.